Hello and welcome to Automotive EV Live. My name is Peter Wooding and thank you for joining us. Our session today not only will be exciting but also interesting. Um, tremendous uh, content and with four very knowledgeable and excellent speakers. So in no particular order, but I will always start with, with ladies first and we'll go anti-clockwise. Um, one of our first speaker is uh, Karen, Karen, sorry, Karen Ebbinghaus from Elon Road. Um, Melanie Lane from uh, New Motion. Greg uh, Ombach from Draxelmeyer. And uh, last but by no means least, Graham Cooper from National Grid. Um, Greg has kindly agreed to moderate the session, uh, which will be geared more around questions and, and answers from themselves. But Please feel free to any questions that you wish to do from the um, audience. Uh, the bar will be on the side where you're watching from. If you don't want to ask any questions directly uh, to everyone, then there will be an opportunity to actually connect with all of our speakers afterwards uh, to ensure that we can answer anything that you've got. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Greg. Thank you, Greg, and thank you all. Thank you very much, Peter, and uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to our session on electrifying the future. I am really very excited about uh, having this panel today together with so great panelists, and we are going to have, uh, I'm sure, a very interesting discussion. Uh, we are going to make first a short introduction about ourselves and then in the introduction I will ask or everybody should answer us the question what we think is the biggest challenge to achieve our goals like for example the Brussels announced recently 30 million electric or zero emission vehicles on the roads by 2030 or UK government ambitious plan to cut CO2 emissions by 68% by 2030, what, mo what means about 46% of the uh, new emission vehicles on the roads, which is about 35 million. Therefore, the future is really going to be electrified and very exciting. We see that the combustion engine is going to still remain with us for some time. But at the same time, we have an uh, enormous growth of the electrification. If you just look the uh, last year, like 2020, we have in Europe the growth of about 105% of the electric cars uh, or the new energy vehicle cars, which were split between pure EVs and plug-in hybrids, about 700,000 electrics and about 600,000 plug-in hybrids. In China, on the other hand, about 5 million new electric vehicle pop up in 2020, and it's a growth of about 30% year over the year. And from this, about 80% electric cars. My name is Greg Ombach, and I am representing today, and I'm working for a company, Drexel Maya. We are a tier one supplier, and maybe you had the opportunity seeing uh, one of the beautiful electric cars is Porsche Taycan, and we are producing the electric battery for this car. And it's also my responsibility. It's the first in the world 800 volt battery system with very fast charging. We are talking about 300 kilowatts plus in order to reduce time of charge. Before I had the opportunity working with the other components, like for example, Siemens Video, where I uh, designed and brought into production electric drive systems, and also with company Qualcomm, where I had the opportunity working on the new technology like wireless charging in order to make charging very simple. Now, from the battery perspective, therefore, I'm able to cover the end-to-end -end what's about the electrification from the car perspective. Uh, if I will should ask or answer the question, what is the biggest challenge from my perspective? I think we did fantastic work from the vehicle perspective, but we are still challenging, or we have a lot of challenges on the infrastructure side, where we have to bring much more public charging infrastructure in place. If we look today, it's about 250,000 public charging spots in Europe, and by 2030, we are going to need about 10 million. It means we have to build every week between 10 and 20,000 in order to address the people which doesn't have their own charging spot at home. And we are here talking about moving from early adopters where we are now to early majority. And from this, a lot of people requires the public infrastructure. 
Therefore, from my perspective, a public infrastructure is going to be and is number one challenge. I am not touching now about the simplicity of the charging and the similar things. We are going to have definitely interesting discussion about those. Now, I would like to give over to Melanie. Melanie, if you could introduce yourself and answer the question, the biggest challenge from your perspective. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm Melanie Lane. I'm the CEO of New Motion, um, and I've been uh, in, in this position now since April last year. So a relative newbie to the world of e-mobility. Um, New Motion is, uh, is, is really, I guess, a, a pioneer in um, the development and installation of, of smart charging infrastructure, um, in case you, you, you don't know us as a company. And we have one, Europe, one of Europe's largest uh, charging networks um, with about 180,000 charge points across, across the, uh, the continent. We, we were set up about 11 years ago um, so we we do see that we've got a lot of deep knowledge uh, to bring to the debate, and it is a complex debate. Um, and we really pride ourselves on knowing and understanding um, our customers. Um, and for us, our customers are um, OEMs. Um, we also work with uh, private customers in their homes, um, and we work with uh, fleet and lease companies. Um, as well as businesses who might want to, um, uh, as Greg just said, put um, charging infrastructure in their own um, kind of office environment. So we work pretty much across the business. And for those of you who don't know, we were acquired by the Shell Group um, a couple of years ago. Um, and what that means is we also uh, kind of through partnership with Shell um, are very involved in the public infrastructure as well. So. Uh, both on road, but also um, kind of the on the go networks. Uh, so, that, you know, what will, I guess, at some point replace the traditional uh, traditional petrol forecourt. Um, from my perspective, I mean, one of the things that has just struck me since uh, moving into the industry is just how dynamic it is, just how fast moving it is, um, how... Uh, many new entrants, new offers, uh, new innovations are coming out all the time. Um, and I have to say it's hard to keep up with it. It's hard to keep up with it as a business in the industry. Um, and I imagine it's similarly uh, hard for, for businesses and consumers um, who are looking to make that energy transition. I think from our perspective, um, I fully agree with Greg's point about infrastructure. Um, so I won't repeat that one. Um, but I think one of the others that we see is the uh, the economics of investment. So how to stimulate the demand, um, which is going to be really important for um, investment into the ecosystem and also for individuals to make that switch. So you're looking for individuals to make the switch. You're looking for businesses to make the switch. Um, and we've seen lots of different um, approaches to demand generation over time. Uh, from awareness building, from education to legislation um, and incentives. And so I think there is a real opportunity here um, if we're talking about that massive shift in mobility like we've kind of never seen before um, to really help consumers and businesses, you know, understand what that switch looks like, understand, um, you know, the, the, the cost of ownership, the, the, the cost associated with it. Um, and to make that transition as easy as possible. So, so, so for me, um, in addition to what Greg's already highlighted, I would say economics of investment, really getting that scale in order to reach the tipping point so those investments are, are, are attractive and viable. Um, and to do that, we need to really uh, kind of stimulate that demand uh, with uh, consumers as well as, um, as, well as businesses. Thank you very much, Melanie. Karin. Yes, hi everyone. Thanks for having me, uh, Peter, and everyone else on, on this panel. Really looking forward to it. My name is uh, Karin Ebbinghaus. I'm the CEO of Elon Road. And we are um, a startup trying to do the uh, challenging task of introducing a new kind of uh, infrastructure, but, um, creating electrical roads where you can charge in motion as well as standing still. And it's designed to suit all kinds of vehicles. Normally, when you think of electrical roads, you think of uh, 
charging long haul trucks, but our solution really targets all kinds of vehicles with the ambition to reduce battery size, you could say, to have a really environmental impact. Not, we're not against batteries, of course. We love batteries uh, because we need something to charge. Uh, so we think we're sort of part of this great puzzle that we need to put in place in order to make this transition. And as you've all been discussing so far, it's, I mean, it's a tsunami of uh, electrification that is coming. And I think we're just sort of in the midst. We can see sort of the water uh, t uh, starting to 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 um, move, but we haven't seen the big wave yet. So so it's it's a challenging time, and and for for us um, the biggest challenge is really the human imagination. I mean, as Henry Ford said, if you would ask the customers, they would just prefer more horses. Um, so when you look upon what kind of infrastructure do we need in five or ten years where we have made this huge transition is it sufficient to have uh, charging uh, poles or uh, or batteries or should we have like a, a more connected system that could uh, offer charging on the go when perhaps you would have uh, renewable energy produced during the day and you can consume it while you're you're driving and then perhaps you could use it to unload uh, Graham, you said before that you're not having any power on Wednesday, so perhaps you could use your uh, your car battery as as a uh, energy storage. So for us, it's the challenge is that really the imagination and and trusting to make these investments that you need going forward. And I mean, the fossil fuel industry I have had like a hundred and hundred twenty years uh, to develop, and we want to do this in ten years. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, I think we need some kind of instruments or initiatives mm -hmm. to it, it, it cannot be placed only on market forces or, or market demand to, to create this. If you want this shift, we need to take a, a, a more solid grip on it. So really looking forward to these discussions. Karin, thank you. Thank you very much. And if you are talking about the electric growth, then definitely we are going to have an interesting exchange on that one. We, uh, once I was at Qualcomm, we also built the electric growth for personal cars and we proved that it works in Paris with Renault together. And we read something like more than 100 kilometers per hour and 20 kilowatts power transfer to the vehicle. Therefore, I know it works on the wireless charging. We are going to discuss your technology as well and your vision in the direction. But now uh, moving to Graham. Graham, uh, National Grid, talk us a little bit about yeah. yourself. So, uh, so firstly, uh, yeah, Graham Cooper, Project Director, Transport Decarbonization at National Grid. Um, so I own uh, getting the UK ready for the transition. Um, so I cover road, rail, aviation and maritime, so all forms of transport, so not just EVs or, or surface transport. Um, the bit of National Grid I work for, because we're a difficult business to understand, so um, in road terms, National Grid owns the motorways of the energy system in the UK. So we have an upstream, the growth in renewables, big offshore wind, nuclear, interconnectors with other countries. And on the downstream side, we have large energy consumers, steelworks, um, glass factories, but also the distribution system, which brings the power to your home. So um, the bit of National Grid I don't work for is the system operation bit, you know, the, the clever guys who are managing the supply and demand in real time. So that's a different part of National Grid, so just so you can for that. So where do I, uh, crikey, where do I see uh, the challenges and opportunities here, Greg? Um, I think the challenge for me is, National Grid or the energy networks industry are critical to success because ultimately if you don't get the upstream energy clean and you cannot deliver that energy to where it is consumed, you cannot make the transition. The challenge that I see though is that we end up with an environment where I would love to be building work, you know, build grid capacity ahead of need, okay? But we work in a regulatory environment that says I can only respond to a single customer. And I have to treat every customer exactly the same. So a grid connection for a charging hub, I have to treat the same as a grid connection for a nuclear power station. So I can't pick winners. I have to be technology agnostic. National Grid also owns the gas transmission system. So um, considering hydrogen and the transition to, to other technologies, and therefore, I guess from my perspective, 
is if I were to give it some uh, one point, it's some joined up thinking. OK, because if the transition to cleaning transport and heat goes swimmingly well, nobody is going to thank the grid networks. However, if um, we get to a world where the grid hampers the um, if the grid hampers the transition, we will certainly get the blame. And so from my perspective, what everybody needs is a level of certainty. So I'd be really interested in picking apart the role of um, legislation, uh, the role of government, but also the role of market. Because I speak to people in the market and they say, no, 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 leave everything to the market. But I see some of those people coming back to me and they say, I see market failures, I need government to intervene. And then I see investors saying, hang on, I can invest in anything if there's some level of certainty. So from my perspective, I'd be really interested to pick up on those things. What do we need in legislation? What is down to government? What is down to free market? Graham, th thank you very much for your introduction and the um, challenges that you also described. Very good, guys. Let's start then our discussion. Uh, we had already seen that we are coming from the different areas. Therefore, it's great because we have a power generation and distribution. We have then the charging infrastructure providers with the different technologies. And also, I am trying to play to be the guy who is on the vehicle side uh, today. Therefore, we can cover end-to-end -end system more or less very well. Now, if, if I will look in direction of the power generation distribution, uh, we have also changes on the grid side because we have bringing a lot of the renew renewable energy into the, into the grid and we are starting decentralizing this grid. It means, for example, here in Germany, you, you are getting some incentive or you had if you mounted, for example, the solar panels on your roof. And then you could create, generate this energy and put it into your electric vehicle in the future. Now, uh, if you if you look from the uh, energy generation distribution, how if you look for this thirty or for this thirty million electric vehicles which we are going to have in or as a goal in ten years on the roads, how you see Graham, uh, this is going to play out from the energy generation perspective. Yep. And how yep. this distributed network is going to impact this what you are currently planning? So, so, Greg, we could spend the next three hours talking about this, but let's try and keep it really succinct. So what I'm seeing from an energy perspective, now bearing in mind National Grid doesn't make energy, we don't buy it, we don't sell it. We just allow it to get from where it's made to where it's consumed, right? So, so that means we're agnostic. What I see is... In the UK, and I'll give you the UK perspective because I've got the numbers for that. So in the UK, we have just had in the Boris Johnson 10-point plan, the commitment to deliver 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Right. So at the moment, it's taken us 20 years to get to 10 gigawatts. We're going to deliver the next 30 in the next nine and a half years. Now, if you look at the volume of energy in just that offshore wind, that is about the same energy as we need to electrify transport in the UK. So if you're going to say, is there enough power? The answer is yes. Now, that, that, you're not going to just have offshore wind farms just powering cars, right? The, the energy is a, is, a, is a market. But what that then tells you is smart charging and smart consumption is actually going to co-benefit clean, cheap energy for transport but it will also help grow offshore wind at the top end. Because at the moment, as I'm sure people on, on, the, on the event will know, when we have low demand and high wind days, the price of energy collapses. It's very difficult to finance a wind farm when the energy costs you money to make. At the same time, what we've often had is the consumer is generally a, a passive consumer. You know, we get up when we get up, we cook dinner when we cook dinner, we can't do the same things. So I see there's a symbiotic relationship created. If we have smart consumption at home, so smart charging, managed charging, and we do that in heating as well, then actually that means that the cars are being used with the cleanest and cheapest energy. The heating systems are being driven by the cleanest and cheapest energy. And that actually gives you an underpinning, effectively a price floor for renewables. So that symbiotic relationship is created when you have smart generation, smart network, smart consumption. 
And that really, for me, is a beautiful symbiotic, which is a more whole system thinking. But coming back to your original question, yes, there will be enough power, but to make sure we do it right, it has to be smart. Thank you very much, Graham. And if you are talking about the smart and we are thinking about the uh, not early adopters, but really early majority and majority, we are going to move a lot to the public charging infrastructure. And we are going to charge the cars, of course, if there is an opportunity and possibility during time when we are at work. Or we are going, for example, to charge those cars once we are doing shopping and so on, or from time to time, once a week, when we are traveling on the fast charging, or maybe after on the fast charging. Now, uh, Melanie, you have a lot of experience uh, from, the, from that perspective. Uh, how do uh, how you think, uh, what's going to be the main uh, usage or what kind of the charging habits we are going to see from the not early adopters but in the early majority or majority group and especially if we are taking into account that not everybody living in the private home but the, we are going to have a lot of the customers which have living in the condominiums and they don't have access to their own plaque how you see this market developing and please uh, you, you are muted All, um, I mean, we're already seeing that shift, to be honest. So the condominium offer, um, working with uh, condominium managers or management companies to provide charging solutions for um, for residents. So, so that that market, um, particularly for example in France, um, other European markets is already starting to pick up. So I, I think I think that's here already. Um, I mean, certainly uh, the. I mean, we see the need to have charging solutions for the whole of market. So we're going to need to continue building out um, that condominium offer. Um, we need to continue to provide support to businesses that are going to make that transition. We also work with, you know, car parks, you know, other kind of public facilities where people are going to be stopped for um, a long period of time. Um, you've then got the um, kind of side of the road um, uh, solutions. Uh, so, for example, you know, Ubertricity in the UK with the lamppost charging. Um, so and then you've got the traditional forecourt charging. So both fast and slow charges um, at those kind of more traditional highway and urban locations. So my sense is that we're going to need all of that. Um, and certainly you see investment into um, all of those uh, kind of channels at the moment. Um, at the moment, you see probably 40 percent being done at home, 40 percent at work, maybe 20 percent on the go. And certainly you're going to see that shift. So we would expect over time, maybe nearer 40 to 50 percent to be done kind of on the go on street uh, parking over time. So. So um, so that 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 kind of infrastructure build up um, is something that. I mean, we're investing heavily in, um, as are many of uh, the other partners in the, in, in the ecosystem. Um, but it's going to take time. I mean, it's a big, as you said in your opening, I mean, the number of charge posts that you need to meet the demand of those, you know, uh, 30 million vehicles. I mean, it's a lot, right? It's a lot of infrastructure. And as Karen said, I mean, you've got years in the oil industry um, and kind of, you know, traditional petroleum products. And we're trying to really accelerate this. So, if anything, it's kind of how do we just keep up with the, you know, with the demand? How do we, as, um, you know, how do we, uh, as Graham said, work together as much as possible to create the right environments uh, for those investments? You, you guys are working, or the Shell uh, acquired you guys a couple of years yeah. back. And now, if you are going to look into the petrol stations in 10 years time from now, do you expect that each petrol station from Shell is going to have the fast charging capabilities where we can recharge our cars in 10 minutes or so? I mean, I mean certainly there's that ambition. Um, the split between kind of fast charging, so DC and AC, I think is you know dependent across the network and dependent on the local customer needs. Um, but, but that's definitely the intent. So again, I mean, it's a massive, um, investment and growth program uh, that we're undertaking and and I was saying before you've got those traditional stations but there's also this need to cater for urban mobility so you've got an increasing number of you know uber drivers and and particularly in lockdown right uh, these drivers on the road in urban settings who are going to need 
um, spaces where they can stop, where they can charge, where they can kind of, you know, get something to eat, have a break, um, and then get on the road. So I think you'll also see an evolution of what that kind of traditional refueling station looks like over time. And maybe instead of having a refueling station, there's another way of charging cars. And here we are moving to Karin. The Karin is talking about the charging on the way. And here, a lot of the research and development happened over over the last couple of years. And there are the different solutions, or they are conductive, or they are wireless charging with the electric magnetic field, uh, electromagnetic field passing the air gaps and so on. Uh, as I already mentioned before, we did a lot of the research uh, during the early days, and we proved that electromagnetics works. Of course, from the business case perspective, it's a little bit a challenging one because you have to bring a lot of the infrastructure into the road, but at the end you could you could uh, utilize it for many vehicles. Therefore, uh, here we had a little bit challenge, and I remember once we worked with uh, 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 Renault on that one, they did a comparison between uh, uh, wireless charging, putting into the road versus fast charging capabilities installing a, a, along the road. And then they uh, found out that installing the uh, DC fast charging is not going to be quite cheaper compared to building the infrastructure into the road for uh, conductive or wireless charging because you still have to own some place and uh, the place was a lot of cost. And as well, you have to bring the uh, uh, energy into the spot where you where you have your fast charging. And of course, uh, you have to maintain this uh, uh, fast charging uh, stations. And uh, Karin, what is your perspective on that one? You are still muted. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think that we're not only developing our technology, we're also developing business models. Because here you have a shift of who's taking the cost. Is it the, the person who uh, pays for the energy or reduces the need for batteries and uh, don't have to prepare all the um, energy to be placed to one pl uh, location for the DC charging? I mean, the technology for uh, in-motion charging has been a bit immature. It's still sort of emerging. But I think now the latest years, it has been sort of proven that it is cost efficient. And uh, we're based in Sweden. And we're part of uh, one of four pilots that the Swedish Traffic Authority is doing to test this um, technologies in um, public areas. So we are building one kilometer bus line in uh, the city of Lund, south of Sweden. And I know that the Swedish government is, is planning to build 2,000 kilometers of electrical roads uh, to 2030. And I think before we sort of compare just the cost for DC or having, I mean, I, I, I should also mention that we have a conductive charging solution. I saw a question before. And uh, so we only have... Uh, we have 98% efficiency, so not much losses there. And we can transfer everything between zero to 300 kilowatt to each individual um, vehicle. It's, so it's a lot of bang for the bucks, I would say, for, for our technology. But it's also what is the value of a car or a vehicle never having to stand still? I mean, for us as, as individuals, when we own our car, it stands still for 95% 95, 95 of the time. That is not really economically viable in the future. I mean, and I think that our kids or, or their kids, they're not so interested in owning a car. They want to be transported. They want mobility as a service. Perhaps uh, for their ego, uh, they don't want to have a, everyone wants to have a Porsche, of course, but uh, uh, BMW, Mercedes or whatever to extend their own personal brand. They just want to be transported. So then we perhaps shouldn't talk about destination charging. We should perhaps talk about utilization charging. For example, Uber. Uh, why do they have to stand still and charge? Of course, they need to eat the drivers, but the same car could be operating 24 seven. That would be much more cost efficient and also environmentally efficient, because if we can reduce the number of cars and vehicles, that is really uh, an environmental benefit. Uh, and of course, that is nothing the automotive industry is driving, that to sell fewer cars. But perhaps we should see the whole world as a mobility, as a service, and they could charge in a different way, because we need to be, I mean, the resources are scarce. So if we can produce less, 
that is better for the environment. Karin, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, one question to you on that one. Uh, if we look from the automotive perspective, then uh, we have always biggest challenge once we have some interface to the infrastructure. And in case of the refueling, it was relatively easier because you had to specify diameter of your pipe which you are putting into your tank and refuel. I remember once I worked on the wireless charging, you know, we spent it a lot of hours in order to agree and define the, nation, or the national standards or in US or in Europe or in, in Asia. Now, if you are thinking about your solution where you are using conductive charging, uh, I know for the fleet it's going to be much more easier because you could add some additional system to, to, the, to the track. But if you if we would like to think really about the personal cars where, uh, like you mentioned, Uber or the similar uh, vehicles, uh, maybe which are not quite fleets, then how we could standardize the solution which you currently are uh, presenting with this conductive one in order to ensure that uh, you don't have to uh, refit it after the pro once the car is produced. I mean, it's fairly easy and, and cheap to retrofit, so uh, uh, that wouldn't be a problem. But of course, it would be more beneficial if we could cooperate with the OEMs directly. So you could, uh, I mean, the, the the mechanical part is no different. Uh, the the, diff uh, the difficulties is to have the software allowing the battery to charge on in motion, so to say. So, uh, But I, I'm sure that you know much more about that than we do. But we are forming part with different international standardization groups together with other actors of, of ground-bound conductive solutions. And, and there are work. So, of course, we need to have standards and legislation in place. Um, but it's more for the industry to trust, I guess, um, that this will work and that other will use it. So it's it's really this leap of faith uh, that I was talking about in the beginning, having perhaps a, a broader mindset looking upon and an uh, interest to uh, deploy new technology. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, now it's your turn. Do you have some questions you'd like to discuss today? I just wanted to go back to um, Graham's point from before, where he was talking about um, the collaboration that's needed, um, driving that level of certainty to create an environment that's kind of balanced between market drivers, but also but, but with the right kind of environment set up. And I and Graham, I just just wondered from your perspective, a bit more detail. What do you think that looks like? Um, you know, yeah. what is it that you think different players need to bring to the table to get that balance right between kind of, you know, what is is going to be market led versus yeah. what's going to be, you know, yeah. um, from infrastructure. No, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really good question, and I can tell you from a British perspective and the stuff that you're starting to see and how we arrived at that. So, um, firstly, when we look at the whatever the technology is, is it static charging is it you know in use charging is it making green hydrogen right all of those need a grid connection so the answer is whatever the technology use you need the right grid in the right place and the grid is where the grid is and the road is where the road is they're not always in the same place so there's a disconnect already between where is the resource and where is it required so we saw the need for anticipatory investment park that for a minute when we were talking to charge point companies, they were saying utilization is key. Now we know things like on route charging is gonna be really important, high power, 350 kilowatt type charging for speedy charge on route. And, and also those high power charges, it's gonna be eight or 10% of charging events, right? Or energy transferred. But people will want to go outside the range of their battery and it not interrupt their journey. So the challenge we have there is the grid connection costs are high. The reason why the grid connection costs are high is you want a future-proof grid connection. So cars are charging at 50 kilowatts, or they were. They're now charging 100, 120. We are getting towards 800 volt technology as the mainstream and 350 kilowatt charging, which will give you know Greg's 10 minute charge right to, to fill a battery. But what we saw was a market failure, because what you've got is grid infrastructure is a long term 40 year asset, and it's not solely used for transport. It can be used for solar generation, battery storage, peaking, everything. So it's, it's a social good. But what you, we see with charge point companies is they often have a business plan that's five or seven years long. 
they're trying to deal with this big upfront cost of grid that they're going to have to live with for 40 years and their business plan's only five or seven. So what we saw is that failure of high upfront costs difficult to deploy. So what we've seen very, very recently, as recently as um, uh, this comprehensive spending review uh, and, and last year, is that they realized that particularly with on-route charging, you need future-proof grid capacity deployed, but that's it, just bring the grid capacity. Let government do that, and then you can leave that open to competition, okay? You can offer truck charging, slow charging, fast charging, premium charging, hydrogen, but once the grid capacity is there, you've got all of your options open. So the one thing I'd say from my perspective is, that's kind of the answer is to, to separate out the bits where you need intervention and the bits where you need market. The charge point market is really liquid. Let's not hamper any innovation there. The business model innovation is quite liquid. Let's not hamper that there. But for any of this to work, you need the underlying grid capacity. And so our ask has always been anticipatory investment, either at transmission level or distribution level. So you've got the right capacity at the right place at the right time. And from a standing start, that's going to take time. If for some, you know, if at the moment we're trying to help the UK motorway network with the, the, the regional power companies, from a standing start, that's two or three years' work to get you that grid capacity. So where is the market three years from now? Because I'll tell you, we need to get on with the wires now so okay. we're ready three years hence. <laughs> um, but we have a regulator that's done a great job of regulating, but of course, they're trying to prevent the cost falling on bill payers. So what they're trying to, to, and the way they've regulated in the past has been brilliant, because what it said is don't spend today what you can't put off until tomorrow, right? But now yeah. we have a net zero target. We sort of need regulation to speed up and say we need to regulate for net zero because then you'll make slightly different decisions. Anticipatory investment might then have a greater value. So I know that's a long sort of answer to your question. No, 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 it's a, a complex of- topic, but I, but I hope that helps. Very good. Thank you very much, Grim. Uh, Melanie, I have a question to you because we uh, pop, one, pop up one question from, from audience and about the charging infrastructure in the cities. And especially if you are thinking about uh, considering wireless charging, which is visually cleaner and more efficient in terms of the keeping vehicles in the service. It means you don't have to really uh, uh, have a mechanical connection. You could do it wirelessly. But maybe before we talk about the wireless, do you think from your perspective on this, what you guys are working, especially once we are moving to much higher powers, as Graham already mentioned, 350 kilowatts, and in, in Asia and China particularly, we have a new standard 500 kilowatts, and there are the tests already going direction of one megawatt especially once the voltage is higher. Now, uh, do you think that we are going to introduce also some robot charging for conductive, which definitely would address the convenience and would address also once we have more autonomous cars on the roads, which can park autonomously and, and charge yeah. uh, by themselves? Yeah. So autonomous vehicles, I mean, it's such an interesting space, right? It's another key disruption um, in, in the whole kind of mobility space and how that will evolve. So yeah, so I mean, for, from a Shell perspective, certainly those pieces are on the agenda of the technology groups. Um, I'll be really honest, in, in our scope at the moment, it is really focused on, on scale and infrastructure and meeting demand. You know, like that at the moment just seems, you know, such a, requires such an enormous um, amount of work to scale up to the level. And of course, when you're talking about scaling up, you're talking about software, hardware, um, smart capabilities that manage the interfaces with the grid. You know, there is so much to do there. I guess my my kind of boundary at the moment is right. Let's let's sort that. We've got five years of um, a, a lot of work to do um, while keeping an eye on the future. And 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 certainly um, the technology guys are are working more those those longer term innovations. And the auto, uh, yeah, automated vehicles is 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 a key, yeah, is a key opportunity and threat for us, yeah. Uh, and just adding on top on this, what you said, definitely it, it, it fits very well. Uh, the wireless charging, the analysis which we did, and also we did a lot of the different tests in the past, 
was showing that uh, we can, for the personal car, we can bring it into the reasonable cost if we are thinking about maximum 11 or 22 kilowatts power, maximum power charging. Of course, there are the programs uh, on the way for buses, where we have a buses in the in the city centers which are driving and they are uh, charged wirelessly, uh, like from, for example, from the conductive dynamics, where they uh, uh, got the power about 200 kilowatts plus, they're going also 200, 300 kilowatts. I know it's a similar area like you, Karin, are working with the uh, conductive roads. And here is another question, which probably fits very well with you, Karin. Uh, it's from Jorn about uh, battery swapping for trucks. Uh, and Jorn is saying, we are working on the uh, concept where we are having the uh, heavy duty vehicle and we are swapping uh, batteries. Uh, we had a similar case for personal cars a couple of years back, better place from Israel. There was a great startup, a couple of billion investment into it and haven't, haven't, haven't been accepted this time in the market because it required standardization of the battery pack, which was very difficult to do for personal car. It's much more easier to be done for uh, heavy duty. Uh, Karin, what is your perspective on this competitor, like the swapping battery compared to the electric road? And I'm not touching today on the fuel cell because it's a completely different beast and uh, it would be the, another path. I know. Um, well, I think that all ways to, uh, I mean, uh, to get a, a more sustainable commercial transportation is good. Uh, from our point, um, we see that if we can reduce battery sizes, the number of batteries, it will be more beneficial from an environmental perspective. And perhaps battery swap would increase. Uh, and I could see that we have a, a shortage in batteries today. So if we want to have batteries, perhaps for um, even aviation and energy storage and for cars, I think we should be uh, keeping the number or, or the resources uh, limited. But I think that it could be solutions for certain areas, perhaps in um, up north or in climate, that it could be hard to have other kind of of uh, infrastructure. So I think that we will see a lot of system working alongside for, for quite some time. And I think it's um, it's a bit of a hazard to do the beta max and VHS choice too soon. Um, because it's like that. I mean, it might not be the best technology that wins, but the, the cheapest and the, the, the one with the most resources. So um, I think we should uh, still keep an open mind for the next five years and see how can we sort of cherry pick from the different systems and merge it into one super system uh, that perhaps can support uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Karin. I, I'm looking just my watch and we are just almost on time. And uh, I would suggest that we do the one additional round and everybody is going to conclude with the main idea for the future. Graham, starting with you. Oh, come to me first. That's always a challenging one. I think that the thing from my perspective is a little bit of whole system thinking. I think people in transport think about transport. I think people in heat think about heat. I think people in offshore wind think about offshore wind. I think everybody, I think if, if I could leave you three things, collaborate, 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 because we're bringing three industries together, energy, transport, and digital. And we need the three legs of the stool to pay, to bring their, their A game equally for this to be a success. So for me, collaborate, 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 bring your A game. Sounds great. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Uh, Melanie, what is your conclusion of the day? Yeah, so I think for me, it's, um, I mean, it's, it is a wonderfully dynamic uh, market and as such, um, innovation is going to continue uh, to be such an important part of this industry. Um, and we need to make sure that there is sufficient kind of incentive and reward in the industry to continue that innovation. Um, and I have no doubt that that will be the case. I fully agree with Graeme that we need to take an ecosystem approach. Um, and this intersection between kind of EV, the home and the power uh, ch chain is so important. And it's both exciting and challenging at the same time. Right. So uh, so I think lots to look forward to in that space. Great. Thank you. Karin. Yes, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's a system shift. 
that we're standing for. It was like uh, 150 years ago, it was the electrification, then it was like putting digitalization, building fibers, and, and, and now we're standing, I mean, this is part of the fourth industrial revolution. And, and it's very exciting to be part of it, but it's also challenging because it's, uh, it's, to be honest, a bit frustrating when it goes so slow. Sometimes you think you would, uh, but then I, I realize things will have its course and, and we will say change coming ahead. But as, as Graham and, and Melanie has uh, emphasized, uh, cooperation is key. Thank you very much, Karen. From my perspective, guys, it's, I think it's the best time ever for people like ourselves working in this industry because currently, as we see, everything has to come together. A lot of the innovation, not just on technology, on business models, new players coming into the market, very dynamic environment. I cannot add more, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Think about the entire system. It's not just car, it's not just charging spot, it's not just energy distribution, it's end-to-end -end system. Them. And there's the one company which is really thinking that way and today is worth more than all other automotive companies. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the name. I'm using this car every day and I have a lot of fun. And you, Graham, as I have said as well. With this, I would like to give back to Peter. Thank you very much for this discussion. Well, thank you, all of you. Absolutely superb um, panel. Um, and I'm sure we could go on and on. Uh, Greg, we did have one last question in from Scott Brown. I don't know whether you can see it. Uh, I don't see it. I'll read if you like. It's got, uh, I think Melanie is onto something. If you can charge your phone with the energy charging pad in your car, you should be able to develop a charging pad that's built into the road or spe specified parking areas. That would simply allow an electric car to park over it for, say, two to five minutes and receive enough charge to get to one's destination. Mm, don't know. What's your thoughts? Um, for me, I think this sits across me and Karen, right? So if you had that kind of technology that um, allowed, that was kind of built into the, um, the the infrastructure of a you know a service station or an urban station, um, uh, and this is an example of collaboration, right? If you could bring that innovation with the kind of the land and the infrastructure that you've got um, existing today around refueling, um, then you could really make something of that. Well, I will give you a ping later on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, and, and just from my perspective, definitely the technology which the mobile phones are using for wireless charging is available on the, for the vehicle as well. It takes a little bit longer uh, than just a few minutes uh, because we are talking about much bigger batteries and therefore we require much more energy transfer. But in general, it's possible, Scott, and uh, the guys are working on this uh, already. Therefore, we are going to see it in there. Exactly. But this there's, is where you see the collaboration is just it's also where rate. collaboration is key, exactly. you see, cause, it's true. Cause, because the thing that's interesting from my perspective is when I talk to people about roads, because we have wires that have to go under roads, the first thing they say is don't touch the tarmac. They're very protective of the tarmac, yeah. people yeah. in the in the roads industry. So it, it's the challenge is everywhere. The challenge is absolutely everywhere. But you're absolutely right. This is this is a beautiful opportunity to share where collaboration can work. And the UK, just for the, the UK is about to publish uh, the UK government, the decarbonisation of transport plan sometime in the next few weeks and the uh, decarbonisation or the or the UK bus strategy. I think there will be lots of opportunity to innovate and collaborate around some of the future technologies. So that comes back to the, you know, the government intervening or stimulating some of that innovation too. So there's a lot to watch in this space. And Graham, well, if you are just going to look into the articles about the solar roads in Asia, you are going to find out that it could be combined energy generation with energy distribution directly into the cars where the yep. current technology and maths can be used and make it happen. Guys, thank you. Peter. Thank you all. Um, really, really appreciate it. It's sort of hopefully we can uh, twist all of your arms for a part two somewhere further down the line because this really was was stunning. On behalf of everybody that's uh, watched or will watch on uh, our on-demand section, thank you, thank you, thank you. And one other part is, uh, talking about myth-busting, um, Graham had the most phenomenal interview uh, with Top Gear. 
Um, I thought you'd have probably changed careers by now because it, it looked like destined yeah. to, to do a new version for that. But uh, what I'll do is on the on-demand part of Catch Up, I will actually uh, put on the link on the bottom in the comments so that uh, everybody who's uh, watched today or who is watching in the future can actually click through and have a look. Thank you all again. Keep safe. Thank and, you. Uh, hope to Thank see you Thank you so again. much. Have a Thank good you. one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.